As we record live during the Coyotes game, we of course have to share our thoughts on the Calgary-Vancouver line brawl and what happened both on and off the ice. We'll also debate the Matt Stajan contract extension, and at the same time look back at the Dion Phaneuf trade that brought Stajan to Calgary. In our weekly Oilers bashing, we of course have to bring up the Daryl Cates letter out of Edmonton, and much more this week on Fireside Chat. This is Fireside Chat episode 36, The Line Brawl. Recorded January 22nd, 2014. Are you ready? See you around. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Featuring Dan, Matt, and Lucas. It's the eve of the Flames and the Coyotes, and we have a lot to talk about. This has probably been one of the most eventful weeks I think I can remember in Flames history this season, and there's a lot of people talking about what's gone on with the Flames this week. Matt, how you doing this week? Uh, could be better. Been a little under the weather, but, you know, so, soldiering on. At least you're here to talk hockey. Luke, are you ready to talk hockey? I'm ready to talk fisticuffs. Well, let's start there. I think the biggest story that everyone's talking about this week is the line clearing brawl last week. The or I guess yeah, last weekend, the Flames and the Canucks went at it. Um, I'll I'll get your guys' take first. What did you think about the Flames putting the fourth line on the ice to start with? Did you think that Hartley had some sort of motive there that he wanted to hurt the Sedins? Let Luke, let's start with you. No, no one puts the like. Brian McGratton has never done anything really untoward to anybody he exclusively fights the other team's uh designated fighter um kevin like you know no no one was going out there to hurt anyone now brian mcgratton has uh crunched daniel sedin in the past with a pretty substantial body check and you know he's out there to bang some bodies so that set the tone in a in a road game no, no one's out there to... Yeah, like, honestly, if Tortorella just put out his first or second line there, nothing would have happened. The Canucks likely would have got a scoring chance out of it, and that's the end of the story. But instead, he responded by putting his goons out there, and what happened, happened. Yeah, I agree with Matt. I think that if, if the Canucks would have just iced their first line, the line with the Sedins, they would have been able to win the faceoff against whoever took it, be it Wes Garth or whoever they would have had at center taking the faceoff. They could have taken the puck, gone down in their end, played with it a little bit, and by then the fourth line would have shifted off and we could have actually had a game of hockey because you know they're not going to be out there all that long. So I think it was Torts doing something that he knew he didn't have to do just to make a point or to, you know, show Hartley that he's not going to back down because I know there's some history between those two. Well, if you really look at it, um, the fault lies with both teams as much as, any, like, just the players on the ice because there's, there's no reason other than, like, okay, it's Saturday night with the Canucks and Flames. I guess let's just all have a fight. Um, you know, Schmied and Butler are out there. Um... You know, BX clearly didn't want to fight anyone. BX had taken the draw probably escalates that more than anything because, I mean, there's I'm sure there's lots of times when fourth lines start against each other and it doesn't end in a, in a line brawl. Um, so both of you, or both sides, uh, you know, you got exactly what you wanted, both of you, so be happy and move on. It, everyone looked like they had a good time. No one got hurt. So... But by the way, we we should uh, we should just mention for our audience that we're all uh, recording this as the Phoenix Calgary uh, game is on, and uh, so we'll be interjecting with our thoughts on random snippets. Uh, as as of right now, there's fourteen twenty four gone in the first period. The brawl was definitely entertaining. Um, I I you know I liked it. I know a lot of people that don't normally watch the Flames games were talking about it. People that don't normally talk about the team. So I definitely think everyone had fun. Everyone was entertained by it. Do you guys think that uh, Tortorella is fine and suspension is warranted? I uh, th- thought that his yes. suspension was a little light. Actually, I think he should have got suspended for more towards a month. But I can't really complain that much. Luke, you think it's warranted? You think he got what he deserves? 
It's fine. Like, the, the only thing suspension-worthy is the coming down the hallway after the period. Um, and you know what? Six games is fine. No one got hurt. And you know what? Everyone's like, oh, it's a black eye for the sport. Um, anyone who's offended by this wasn't watching in the first place. Uh, and you know what? If the only thing this is going to do is generate more attention and revenue for the game. Uh, you know, you've... If you're not being hated by someone, you're probably not making as much money as you could. And I will refer you to everything that is successful on the planet, whether it's Apple, uh, um, what else, uh, the Toyota Corolla, the, uh, the NFL, um, Richard Sherman. I mean, if you're successful, people hate you. It's just the way things are. So the more things we can do to make people vocally hate on the game i think the better well and there's a lot of people like the fight and the tortorella and have had over a million views on youtube so there's obviously people that aren't normally probably watching hockey who are viewing that and you're right i mean if it's bringing viewers and bringing revenue to the game it's good for the game i mean we don't want travesties like you know the bertuzzi moore thing or stuff like that but, I mean... Nobody got hurt. It was just Tortorella beating the flames in the hallway. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's a spectacle. It's all entertainment. It's all fun. And we, you know, we like seeing this crap. Um, as much as the media doesn't. Because, you know, from their seats of privilege 200 feet above the ice, they can be like, oh, it's not hockey. Well, you know what? It's easy to be all high and mighty about the purity of the sport when you get to see the best level of hockey in the world every other night in the winter time for free uh but for those of, of of us that have to shell out 80 bucks a ticket uh you know what i would like to see something interesting and that was interesting that was fun oh, it was, so for sure uh so let's let's not let's not act like uh you know there was a, there was a travesty of justice committed here. The other thing I thought was entertaining about it was the whole Clint Malarchuk thing. Him just come flying out of the dressing room trying to get in Tort's face. Did you guys see that part? Oh yeah. I oh yeah. I had to watch oh, it a yes. couple that, times, that, but I Clint is a boss. I have to say that. It's not nearly as fun as uh, as Bob Hartley just popping out and saying uh, either go f yourself or you're no fucking ref. Um, yeah, I have no idea what he said. I saw his face pop out, but I, I didn't know what he was saying. He, he looks like he's on, like, a board where he just sort of, like, slides out and then is pulled back in. <laughs> um, it, it, it was... Oh, gosh. I like that. And you know what? It's one of these things, like, when John, as soon as John Tortorella starts, uh, starts screaming and doing his little thing, you know, lighting his hair on fire, um, don't you just wish, like, everyone on the flames just turns around rather than shouting back just grins like and like shows all their lack of teeth and just starts waving and you know be like you know you're such an asshole that's probably what i would have done i thought it was funny that gratz had to almost give malarchuk a face wash to get him out of torta's face well yeah he definitely had to pull him back like so that was that was literally the hold me back man hold me back except hockey players don't need to say hold me back someone actually just has to do it because otherwise they're gonna you know like, that dude stared down death. What, do you think that John Tortorella scares him? I doubt it. Do you guys think that uh, the Flames fine, I guess it's a fine towards Hartley, actually, but do you think the Hartley fine is justified, 25000 Yeah, a little bit. You know, like, you can't just penalize the one guy. You know, like, Hartley did throw his fourth line out there, and Wes Garth did you know take a draw for like the first time ever so you know but if you're going to penalize us for put, for having Westgar take a draw why would there not be a monetary penalty for Vancouver for having a defenseman take the draw yeah that's the thing like uh okay so Westgar takes the draw um i would guess because Lane was going to line up at center as well like who was the original center on that play i believe it was supposed Probably. to be Lane Okay, so and that dude's a, a goon as well. Blair Jones isn't a goon, so Westgarth comes in to answer the you know, stand up for Blair Jones, and you know, then all of a sudden Kevin BX is doing his thing, and so it's just like, 
what are we what are we really doing here? And it's like Hartley doesn't deserve a whole lot of uh, criticism for this because you're you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to start a fourth yeah, line. Yeah, we broke you, you no know, rules. Home ice advantage means you get to. Yeah, home ice advantage allows you to make last change and decide who you want to match up against. That Tortorella decided he wants that matchup. Yeah, if we're at home and we did that, I could see there being some negative if we matched his line with our fourth line. But we put the fourth line out. The home team had every advantage to match it however they wanted to match it. Why is that even a negative? If we put our fourth line out to match their fourth line and that happens at home, all that we did was give people a good show. I don't... There, There is... Gosh, it's a violent game. Go watch tennis. That uh, Jeannie Bouchard chick is really hot. You know? And it's, you know, really warm in Australia, and I'm sure she'll be sweating and whatnot, so, you know, then you don't have to get your sensibilities offended. I didn't even know tennis was on. I didn't know there was a tennis tournament in Australia. Yeah, it's the Australian Open. It's one of the majors. See, I don't pay any attention to this, tennis. This, this, this Canadian chick is, the, is like, in the, either in the semifinals or on the verge of winning... Go or winning the semifinals or something, then it's the the single greatest advance of female Canadian tennis players ever had at a major event. Uh, so good for her. Wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, but you know what? No one's gonna get punched at the Australian Open. So if you're worried about what your kids think, I don't know. Let Let's talk about that. Um, what What do my kids think? Because I I am sort of of the opinion. Um, you know, you see the, the signs of the dome says, please don't swear, curse, etc. And I understand you sort of want to, you know, you want to make it a situation where people aren't afraid to take their their kids to a game. But if you're being honest, um, Saddle Dome, uh, the Saddle Dome and Flames game, that's for grown-ups. That's, you know, that's an $80 or whatever average ticket price, one of the highest in the league. Beers are eight twenty five for a barely passable uh, domestic. And you know what? If you want to take your kid to the joy of, and give him the joy of hockey, or the, her, uh, that's what the hitmen are for. Um, flames are for grown-ups. I understand why that's not the, you know, the tact they take, but a part of me always sort of muses about that. Uh, you know, I think that it's like any public venue. I mean, you know, you're out in public, there's a certain level of decency and you know, way that they want people to act in public, I think as long as you've got Harvey the Hound there, they're going to be expecting that it's a family-oriented product. I suppose, but I mean, here's the thing. You're not really out in public, because public doesn't make you pay $80 to get into it. No, but if you're paying 80 bucks to get in, you kind of have to play by the rules of whoever you're getting into, right? No, and I understand that. And, and see, that's the, the flip side of the argument. It's just, th there is this element of, like, this is grown-up time. I didn't I didn't spend, you know... 250 bucks on club seats to pay attention to the sensibilities of your kid. Now, I might, you know, maybe I'm insensitive. I am being insensitive here. On, on our way to the trade deadline, we've talked in the past about Matt Stajan getting dealt, and then all of a sudden uh, we read in the paper that Stajan is re-signed. He signed a four-year deal here, worth about $3 million a year. What do you guys think? Let's start with you, Matt. What do you think of Stajan being a flame long-term? Well... It, I can understand both sides of the argument. Like, we do need to have veteran players, and, like, we also need to get more prospects and picks in there. Personally, I would have rather see him get dealt, but I can understand the other side of the coin as well. I, as I said uh, on, uh, on, the, on the internet, um, I don't hate staging nearly as much as I used to. He's a very useful player in the right role. He's struggled a little bit lately, but, I mean, I would attribute that as much to David Backus taking out his knee as anything. Um, I, I've, I've sort of... I, I am of the school of thought now almost that if we're actually in a rebuild, like, you need NHL players to sort of isolate and insulate your young kids. Uh, I, and I get that. I understand that. And However, I do question the, the, the common logic that... Oh, okay, so we're going to trade Camilleri and Stempniak and our pending UFAs, and we're going to call it a day. I think you could probably do your cause a great deal more service if, at the deadline, the names we were trying to move were Weidman, Hoodler, and Glencross. Veterans with term 
but good contracts, uh, Weidman, you might may or may not agree, but you know, if you extend Russell, Russell fills Weidman's shoes pretty well. Um, and you have NHL level players in your Stepniaks, etc., that can sort of handle a load. But you know, if you're a contending team, are you going to give up more for uh, Glenn Cross and Hoodler or uh, Camilleri? What's more valuable to you, or Camilleri? Uh, I think it depends too. If you're a contending team, you may not have a lot of salary room to play with, so you might want to just take the rental. That's true as well. Um, I would possibly argue, especially with Glenn Cross. Uh, you can fit Glenn. You will find a way to fit Glenn Cross in. If it has to mean take uh, the Flames take back a pending UFA, who's probably a semi decent NHL player uh, that they could also extend and then, you know, again, temporary vets. Because Hoodler and Glenn Cross, I don't think are, are, are you know, and Weidman are, are not core pieces going forward. They're sort of guys that make you a little bit more competitive now. And I'm not recommending at all that we, you know, encourage tanking or anything but I'm, I'm just sort of musing like what do we get more value from and does the product on the ice differ a huge deal if we add uh, the assets from a Hoodler, Glenn Cross and Weidman series of moves as opposed to you know Camilleri and uh, Stetniak and it's definitely a different strategy for sure yeah I, uh, I haven't I haven't thought a lot about it to be able to talk a lot about it with you, but I'd be happy to uh, chat about it again as we come close to the deadline and I got some time to think about that because that is interesting. Well, it's definitely an interesting take. And, like, especially it also depends, uh, like, what your return is going to be and, like, what type of personalities you want in the team going forward. Like, Say Yuri Hoodler, he might not necessarily have the right personality that the other players on the team like. So perhaps moving him might work. I don't know. It's just, you know, it gives the other options, that's for sure. Yeah, I I think the question of return was a good one. I mean, you know, going back to the Stajan thing, I don't think we would have actually got all that much for Stajan come the deadline. So I think that re-signing him to a deal that... While it's more than I would have wanted to pay for him, as we've talked about, the Flames have a lot of money to throw around, so I'm fine with it. Um, I, I think that Stajan, he's obviously shown here, like you know, Luke said, he doesn't suck as much as he used to. I don't hate him as much as I used to. I think he's a useful piece. And I think he's shown that you know he, he can play at the NHL level. So I think for what we would have got for him, I bet we would have got a third or a fourth round pick. I think it's probably better to keep him around here. Yeah, Matt, I mean, Matt Stajan to me is probably a, pl- a player that gets a second at the deadline. I say that knowing, you know, nothing about the ins and outs of trading in the NHL, but seems like a contender to shore up a third-line center, you know, given that Dominic Moore gets traded for a second-round pick every year. I mean, Matt Stajan is better offensively. I'm sure defensively, you know, it's kind of, you know, Moore might be a bit better, but whatever. Um, money, I mean, he took a pay cut his his cap hits what 400 grand less than it was or 350 grand and then the cap space isn't the issue so for uh, a guy who's been our best natural center for better part of two years now i mean um it's it's fine the money has never really been an issue the issue has been why are we expecting this particular player to be something that he isn't and he never was I think, well, I, I mean, I guess maybe he had one. Did he have one 60-point season with the Leafs? I think so. Yeah, the, my disappointment in him not reaching those expectations is, oh, he just made a very nice defensive play. Ha- has very much uh, passed. Oh, David Jones, by the way. Oh, my goodness. David Jones is, uh, for the first, this is the best uh, 10 minutes of hockey David Jones has played uh, in a good three months. Let's just say that right now. No, I'm, I'm just saying, like, we're 13 minutes into the first period. This is the best stretch of game action David Jones has had since the first four games. Uh, and and this is a guy who, you know, like, that dude makes $4 million for reasons unknown. I know. I guess because whoever the old GM, who was the GM of the Avs before? Uh, Sherman. Greg Green? Sherman? Yeah. That fool. Yeah. From, from the Craig McTavish and Kevin Lowe school of hack frauds. Um, just awful, awful GMing. Um, 
But it would be nice if that guy became reason like uh, just you know David Moss type you know twenty goal scorer who's kind of good defensively. I I really got a kick out of uh, Sportsnet broadcast the other night selling the hell out of David Jones' return about how he was second on the team in hits or something. It was just like literally it, it's a guy who does nothing but run into other objects. That's what all he's bringing to the table. Did you guys see the story about uh, Burke saying Burke talking about the staging deal from Toronto? Yeah. No. What What did he say? Uh, Burke pretty much said that he never actually wanted to trade Stajan, and the only reason that he ended up throwing Stajan in on the Fanoff deal was that Daryl was adamant that Stajan had to be part of the deal. Okay. So I thought that was kind of interesting because I always assumed that Burke was just getting rid of him because he wasn't performing perhaps to his potential over there, so he tried to saddle us with him. But the fact that Daryl requested him is kind of interesting. Well, the thing is, is that at the time, Stajan was a 50 to 60 point center that like won like 57 percent of his draws and you know was a solid two-way player it's just you know like even after we got him he continued playing like that for the remainder of that season and then they kind of fell off the face of the earth so like i don't think anyone would have complained as much with that trade if stajan maintained his 50 to 60 point playing status instead of 30 to 40. Oh, I totally agree with you, yeah. Here's the thing. I think we would have simply because, like, uh, the foundation of a trade, number one, if it's going to be for FNUF, what the hell else was there going to be? Like, if, what, White, Hagman, and Mayers gets you Dion FNUF? I mean, you better give us a 50-point center who's good, on, good at face-offs. And, I mean, it, it just... Stajan at that point also was a, was a guy who, no one remembers this, but the Leafs had a deal in place for Pronger from Edmonton after that cup run. And the only reason Pronger never ended up in Toronto is because John Ferguson Jr. wouldn't include Matt Stajan in that deal. I mean, I read that on the internet and I assume it's fact. I've, I've heard it enough places that I, you know, and it sounds juicy enough and that, that I, I like it. Um... But I, I like that to also, if that story is true, the, uh, I mean, Burke said it, so it probably is. I, I like that we have a GM with the balls to go in on a Dion Phaneuf trade and be like, yeah, I'm going to give you absolutely nothing for a guy one year removed from a Norris nomination. And, yeah, this, this, is, this is magic beans. Not even magic beans. Like, I know I'm monologuing a bit now, but I think I would have been... Everyone would have been a little bit more okay with this deal if it was, like, Matt Stajan, a first-round pick, and a prospect for Dion Phaneuf and Schuster and Ollie or whatever. Um, it's the fact that we got no draft help whatsoever, and it was such an obvious panic trade that it pissed off everyone. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that there was... when I When I read the deal, I remember sitting at the computer, reading the deal, going... There's got to be more to this. Like, you know, maybe it's not confirmed yet. But, yeah, I kept looking at it going, we got a bunch of kind of depth forward guys and staging for our pinnacle defenseman, Schustrom, who was, you know, doing pretty good that year, and who and all and uh, Ollie, who was seen as a top prospect. So I was looking at it going, wow, either we got hosed or this deal hasn't fully been unveiled yet. No, I, I, I love it, too, that that's often the reaction to so many trades these days. Like, gotta be something else coming like when the Oilers traded uh, Dubnik for uh, whoever the hell they got Hunwick uh, Matt Hunwick yeah um, and, and it's like oh gotta be more coming no not really sometimes like you look at the people involved and it's just like okay sometimes just there's nonsensical trades and, but the, the most baffling is just like you look at that deal and you go why why, 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 why that? Like, shop around. Well, and, that, and that's what they said at the time. I remember other GMs, like I think um, Holmgren in Philadelphia said that it, he was never even approached, and if he was, he would have made Daryl a better offer. I remember hearing that from, oh, I believe from five or six GMs at the time. Yeah, well, of course. Anytime you see a GM get fleeced, you know, it is what it is. 
I remember reading at the time that Burke didn't even make the deal with Calgary. It was uh, his assistant at the time who did the deal. So it's like, you know, he knew almost, I think, that he, he didn't need to make the deal. He could pull the wool over their eyes. So it's like, yeah, you go do this deal. I don't need to be part of it. Well, knowing the kind of person Burke is, that seems very questionable, at least for his... Uh... Well, he may have come up with the, his character. He may have come up with the framework. He may have said, "Okay, it's going to be essentially FNAF for Stajan. You know, feel free to give the Flames anybody else from this list they want." And it was a list of all of his depth guys. Who knows exactly what was done? But the the rumor was that he was not hands on through the final deal all the way. Well, gosh, bodes well for us in the future, I suppose. Well, you know, I I think it's I think it's very good to see though that you know a guy that Burke traded away in Stajan, he had enough confidence to re-sign this year going forward. And I think for a guy like Burke, who's been who's seen him in Toronto, seen him here, I think it is a vote of confidence that there's definitely something that we want to keep around in Matt Stajan. Yeah, I think that uh, Burke has acquired Corburn Colburn a few times too. I think he got him from Anaheim and Toronto and then brought him in here. So, yeah, I mean, you see it with every GM, bringing in guys they like. But to me, it's always a bit of a vote of confidence when you do bring in a guy that you've done business with in the past. You're thinking Anaheim with Col Or not Anaheim, Boston, right? Um, No, I think Colburn was... No, Colburn was Boston. It was a capital A trade. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I knew. I knew he came. Burke acquired him and then reacquired him here. So I know that he got him in Toronto from somewhere. Thomas Coverley. There's a. There's a, there's a fantastic fall off a cliff of a career. Um, you know, you go from being the most highly sought after trade deadline acquisition, to signing what is almost universally regarded as an awful deal in free agency the moment you put pen to paper, which you don't even get like four months through before they trade you to Montreal, and then Montreal, either what, what did Montreal do, buy him out? Did they buy him out? Like, it was a real inauspicious end for a guy who wasn't a horrible defenseman. Yeah, I don't know. I, I didn't think, that would be an expensive, because that was a big contract, that would have been an well, expensive buyout. I guess relative, I mean, it was like a three-year, $12 million deal or something like that. It was three years, 16, something. It wasn't. Well, no, it wouldn't have been that much. It would have been in the neighborhood of like four and a half for the cap hit, if I recall correctly. Um, oh, yeah, you're right. On on June 28, 2013, he was a compliance buyout by the Canadians. So, yeah, they, they did buy him out. That feels like... It, uh, gosh, that that wasn't quite as... Ooh, nice save by Ramo. Um, that doesn't feel like it happened that recently. That feels like it happened ages ago, but apparently not. And they owe him two thirds of his contract for double the length of the contract. So I mean, they're gonna have a cap hit, be it a big one or a small one, for what no, six years? No, if then? it's a compliance buyout, it doesn't count against the cap. That's the point. Um. Oh, is that the way it is? Okay, so they have to buy him out, but it doesn't count against yeah, like, the cap. Yeah, like Gallov is a compliance buyout, so they give him twenty-three million dollars over whatever it was like. 14, 15 years or something, and but but he's no longer on their cap. Uh, you're right. Yeah, you're right, because a regular buyout, they count against the cap. Compliance buyouts, they don't. There is a real charming simplicity to the way the NHL salary cap functions, especially when you compare it to uh, the NFL, which nobody understands how that works. Um, NBA, I mean, I, th- I, I don't even know. The NBA has got some sort of salary, like hard cap or soft cap, but like... Everyone always seems like they're forty million dollars over payroll, despite the fact they've only got a roster of twelve guys. Um, I like that the NHL salary cap is just very cut and dried. It's like, no, you just can't spend more than this. There's like a five million dollar cushion you can spend in the summer, uh, but you have to be under it by this date. Otherwise, um, you can't play. Yeah, I, I like that. There's no lo- there's no luxury taxes. There's no yeah no way to wiggle around it. It's pretty much this is your minimum. This is your maximum. Spend a number between those two, yeah. and you're good. Cap floor should be lower. I understand why it's not, but cap floor should be lower. But even even still, I mean, there is a cap floor, which I think is necessary in a salary cap scenario like this in a league where a lot of teams yeah, aren't making money. Yeah, because I mean, see teams like Florida with like a twelve million dollar payroll or something. <laughs> Well, what was it Donald Fair said? Um, the, the the core 
Something about nobody was ever making any money, basically. That, that was something Donald Fair said when he was head of the MLBPA. Oh, yeah, no, it was you can never have enough pitching and nobody ever made any money. Um, but clearly, like, people are making money. And it's, it's one of these things, like, for tax purposes where I'm sure it's, like, more advantageous for some teams to show a loss. Like, as rich as these guys are, I, I don't see how anyone of their caliber... Like, they don't... People in this that get to the level where you can be an NHL owner don't, don't just lose tens of millions of dollars. No, it's true. You're, you're, you have to be a sharp businessman to get to that stage. And yeah, you're you're not gonna just bleed, yeah, well, like, bleed out the, the on cash. The Florida Panthers, for example, like they're losing thirty million dollars a year, but the the owner of the complex he gets a tax break and like for the rest of the business, and he ends up making like a hundred million a year on the other things. So net gain, he's making money, but you know, going with the loss leader. Otherwise, they probably would have been moved a long yeah, time ago. And, you know, these guys are far smarter businessmen than we are. I mean, I imagine some teams have a, a model like the Flames where they own everything in town. And so even if your hockey team was losing, which is not here, but even if it was, you'd have something else you could make your money back on. Speaking of NHL owners, did you guys read the uh, open letter from Daryl Cates? Yeah. <laughs> I hope our team is never so bad that we have to write a letter to the Sea of Red saying, I'm sorry, we suck. I hope we're just never that deluded where it's like, look, we've only been doing this for four years. And we've shown no improvement at any point. So... Well, if you think about it, like, since 91, uh, the year after they won their last Stanley Cup, like, they have not finished above sixth in the conference at any point in the, the following 23 years. And I've only finished in the playoffs like five times in that time. So, you know, like it's one rebuild after another after another. Like they've never actually gotten anywhere other than that one fluke year where they made the run to the finals. Right after the first lockout with Roly the goalie in net. Yeah, and that that was it. You know, they were that Edmonton team full marks for effort. They honestly they should have won that Stanley Cup. Um, were it not for Mark Andre Bergeron throwing Andrew Ladd into Dwayne Rollison for no reason, um, and hell, you see Markin and dresses as the backup. He probably doesn't misplay that puck. Uh, they go to overtime. Maybe they win, and you know, rather than going down three one. Uh, and having to storm all the way back, they probably do win that that series. So, um, bless you, Marc Andre Bergeron and Andrew Ladd. You will never have to buy a beer in Calgary uh, because, yeah, you're the reason Edmonton doesn't have one good thing to you know hold over us until we figure out what to do with the rest of our lives. When I saw the letter online, I was talking to some friends of mine, and two of the best pieces of feedback I heard was, I have a friend who's now making a shirt with the Oilers logo on the front, and on the back it says, Inverse Dynasty. This is like a, a reverse dynasty. Instead of being a good team for, what was it, eight years during the 80s? They're being a crappy team for that many years during the yeah, like, during the Ever uh, since they traded Pronger, it's just been a rolling calamity up there. Like, I, I could... You know, if I was an Oilers fan, like, I would, you know, give up on them until they changed the management entirely. Because, you know, like, how can you be that bad at your job and still be employed? I know some Oilers fans, and they've given up on the team. Like, that city seems to, yeah, a lot of people are just giving up on the Oilers. You could cheer for other teams. They have a WHL team again. That's doing pretty good. I get that Daryl Cates doesn't give a damn about the hockey team, that he's only doing it to leverage his real estate holdings, but, like, surely, like, someone's come to you and been like, hey, look, man, we get, you know, we're looking at polls that have 90% fire the asshole in charge here. Um, I know he's your boy, but, you know... Maybe a little bit of goodwill might help your cause getting this new arena built. Um, 
be, because these guys are you know ready to burn this dude in effigy. It doesn't matter that he helped them win five Stanley Cups uh, in the eighties, because uh, everyone uh, who was around for that now has either Alzheimer's or black lung, so they don't care. Uh, all they know is if they're lucky. Uh, Curtis Joseph save against Dallas uh, and Todd Marchant's goal. A bunch of defeats to the Dallas Stars before and after, and also first round exits to the Colorado Avalanche, and a playoff run where Pronger was a beast. Uh, other than that, they don't care. They don't have any connection to the, the the teams of the past. No matter how bad our team is, we can always look up north and see a team that had to apologize to their fans for being so crappy. So and we can always thank ourselves that we're not in that position. It's it's just mind blowing. Like. Fire the guy. You fire him, and every you get another five years of goodwill, because it's just like, oh well, at least this asshole's not here anymore. But no, 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 we're we're. I I really like that boys on the bus documentary. Uh, so this guy's gonna get to screw over my business that could be making way more money if everyone in the city didn't hate me. If Cates has a thing he doesn't want to fire him, then reassign him somewhere, or make him like Ken King and make him president of some other division and bring in a real hockey guy. But his, well, Kevin Lowe is a real hockey guy. This, the problem is his whole stink is on the organization, and, you know, if you've got cancer, you want it cut out. You don't want it, you know... Well, sir, uh, well done, Mr. Stevenson, your cancer, good news. The cancer is no longer in your lungs. It has, however, migrated to your pancreas. It's just, that's what it happens when it comes back. Kevin Lowe has metastasized himself onto the Edmonton Oilers, and, you know, y you're, get rid of them. I mean, or don't. I mean, I guess I don't care, but, um... As a Flames fan, I'd almost rather they keep him there, because it gives us something to look at and laugh at, even though we're doing bad. No, see, I don't think it does, because I think when your rivals are good, like, you get pushed to be better. Because as long but as we, you like, Vancouver's arrival is doing very good. I know, and but the, it's it, you know, we just all, we hate them anyway. Um, but I think there's an element of like, and this is probably why the Southeast is always terrible, or or was always terrible, whatever it's called now, the Metropolitan, the Atlantic, what's it called? Um, Nobody cares in that in that neck of the woods. So there's no and, and don't don't no one argue that like, oh, they've got fans. No one really cares. There's no media attention that's been like, well, they should really fire Dale Talon or someone. Um, no one cares. Uh, when your best when when your rival up the highway is kicking ass, it makes you wanna be better and it forces you to build your team to beat your rival, because your fans aren't going to stand for getting constantly humiliated and having to hear about it because half the people they work with are probably fans of the other team. Just like fans up in Edmonton, half the people that work in Edmonton are probably Flames fans. So, th there is sort of a motivation, and when everyone sucks, it's just like, oh, well, at least we're not better, as bad as Edmonton. I don't care. I would like us both to be good and have our rivalry mean something instead of weird passive-aggressive Border skirmishes. The Battle of Alberta has always been fun. Was well, the end of the first period in the Coyotes game? Should we get out of here and go enjoy the rest of it? Sure. Yeah, this actually looks like a reasonably entertaining uh, Coyotes game, all things considered. We have one goal so far from Monahan, assisted by Galliardi and Colburn. Matt, do you want to promote yourself online? Uh, on Twitter at Caged Grape. And Luke, what about you? I'm at Luke1701 on Twitter. And obviously, you can find our show online, firesidechat.ca. You can subscribe. You can get all the newest episodes. We're on Twitter at Fireside Podcast and on Facebook at facebook.com slash firesidechat. Gentlemen, enjoy the game, and we'll talk to you next week. Yeah, take it easy. Suck it, Tom. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.